Welcome everyone, I am Dr. Tarang Kapoor and I teach philosophy. Today we are discussing deontological ethics with special reference to Immanuel Kant. We will take forward the discussion from the previous lecture on the second and the third formulation of categorical imperative and begin this discussion by understanding the perfect and imperfect duties given by Immanuel Kant. And these duties are related to the three formulations of categorical imperative. We will also discuss the significant criticisms raised on Kantian moral philosophy. Along with uh, studying the central features of Kant's doctrine. Let us begin our discussion on perfect duties. Perfect duties are, as the term suggests, perfect or absolute. A perfect duty is one which admits of no exception in the interests of inclination. We have a perfect duty not to act by maxims that result in logical contradictions when we attempt to universalize those maxims. The illustration of making a false promise is already discussed in the first formulation of categorical imperative. The conclusion from there is that we should not make a false or lying promise both because we could not consistently will it for all and because it violates our obligation to treat persons as persons that is not to use them only for our own purposes and this gives us a hint into what is the concept of perfect duty for Kant. Such duties are perfect and necessary. That is, we should absolutely refrain from making any kind of false promise. It is necessary that each person obeys the same rules that he or she wants others to obey. The person who commits a wrong act adopts one course of action for himself, but he or she wants others to follow a different one. This will lead to contradiction. For example, let us take example of the matter of truthfulness. The person who tells lies wants others to tell the truth. Isn't it contradictory? If they do not tell the truth, then his lie will not accomplish the purpose he has in mind. So suppose other persons are um, also lying alongside the one who is lying. So this one person is lying and the other persons are also lying alongside. Will this person be able to achieve what he aspires to achieve? Certainly not because one will uh, not know who is lying. Lying is a type of activity that cannot be made universal at all for this reason. Suppose it could be made universal. We would then know that all individuals are lying when they made statements to us. And then they will not be able to deceive us at all. So the liar is making an exception of himself and it is for this reason in as far as he is making an exception for himself that is that he wants himself to be taken seriously by lying his act is wrong. The same can be seen in case of stealing as an act. The thief does not want everybody else to be a thief. If all were thieves there would be no private property and then it would be impossible for that thief to steal. Stealing is taking of another person's property and if there is no private property then whose private property am I going to take? So from the perspective of the first categorical imperative we then have a perfect duty not to do those things that are inconceivable as universal practices. Using the second form of categorical imperative we have a perfect duty not to do what violates the requirement to treat people as people. So from the first point also uh, the perfect duty uh, is explained and from the second point uh, which is the second formulation of categorical imperative treating humans as end in themselves again we have a perfect duty to obey this law. Now we will come to the imperfect duties. Imperfect duties are in strike contrast to perfect duties. Imperfect duties are circumstantial in nature. One cannot reasonably exist in a constant state of performing an imperfect duty. Unlike the perfect duty where one ought to 
exist in a constant state of performance in imperfect duties we ought not to they are in this sense more flexible on the agents who follow them so imperfect duties are also called meritorious duties doing them adds to your merit but if you fail to perform them then uh, you are not uh, held accountable in the same manner as in case of perfect duties so for example we have an imperfect duty which is the duty to act only by the maxims that we would desire to be universalized since it depends on whatever on somewhat on the subjective preferences of our nature this duty is not as strong as the perfect one but it is still morally binding on us as such unlike perfect duties you do not attract blame and should not be uh, you know um, completely imperfect uh, uh, accounted for but you shall receive praise for it should you complete this kind of a duty as you have gone beyond the basic duties and have taken duty upon yourself so imperfect duties are those that are never truly completed like imperfect duty to cultivate one's own talent kant has taken this example in illustrations in the groundwork of metaphysics of morals the example of egoism can be taken to understand this uh, idea of imperfect duty we have an imperfect duty not to be egoist but to help people for their own good and not just for our own good however just when to help others and how much is a matter of our choice there is no absolute duty to give one's whole life to help others so uh, we cannot be held uh, morally accountable if we uh, refrain from helping others that's the kind of message we are getting here one implication of this distinction is in handling the conflict of duties so perfect duties will always take precedence over imperfect duties and i'll come to this point when we discuss the criticisms of kantian ethics now when we take significant criticisms uh, of categorical imperative uh, there are these uh, five heads under which uh, they can be broadly classified and now there can be innumerable other uh, points raised against uh, different aspects of immanuel kant's uh, moral philosophy uh, but these are the five central ones which we are going to discuss one by one let us first start with applications of the moral law the critics have pointed out problems with application of the first formulation of categorical imperative for example there are many things that i could will as universal practice that would hardly seem to be of a moral obligations so we want everybody to follow certain uh, social etiquettes uh, we want uh, people to dress in a particular code when visiting restaurants and there might be many other universal practices which are followed in our uh, world or we wish um, or want them to be absolutely followed but they do not seem like moral obligations so should everything that can be willed then as a universal practice become a moral law that is one question and this brings us to the uh, application aspect of the first form of categorical imperative where it is easy um, to give a theory about universalization but it is difficult to achieve this theory into uh, an application when it comes to apply it to the day to day life now when we see the second form of categorical imperative it also suggests the same kind of problem with application it is not always easy here to determine whether one is using Uh, a person or not remember the second form of categorical imperative says that we ought not use human beings as uh, instruments to uh, further our own ends so here you know when are we using a person as a means what is coercion what is simply influence or what is deception in such cases uh, needs more explanation when i talk to a friend into doing something for me how do i know whether i am simply providing input for person's own decision making or whether i am crossing the line and becoming coercive towards that person moreover if i do not tell the whole truth or how much truth do i tell should i withhold the information from another person 
should this count as a deception on my part to uh, hiding certain information and not telling the right inform uh, the, the full information I must say not the right because right information you ha have a perfect duty to tell but how much information am I uh, trying to hide in certain situations can also uh, be a problem with respect to application of the moral law. Kant has rightly argued uh, that the ease of use and apparent adequacy of the principles are not any proofs for the correctness of the principle. So any principle uh, you know should uh, not be made thinking about whether it is easy for people to follow the principle rather you know ought comes first and ought cannot be determined by is we did this distinction between is and ought in our introductory lecture on ethics and uh, this uh, distinction is actually at the bottom line of uh, any uh, deontological ethical theory and uh, in the same way Immanuel Kant be a, being a, a central figure in the deontological ethics uh, will ob always give precedence to the principle over the concept. So we see that uh, over the practice sorry we see the difficulty of application is a problem for most if not all moral philosophers and this uh, brings forth the gap between the theory and practice which is often difficult to mitigate. Now let us come to the second uh, kind of criticism which is raised uh, on uh, the importance of consequences when it comes to performing moral actions. Now some people are immediately impressed by the idea that one's intention count for more than the outcome of one's actions and that the question of right and wrong is uh, in itself is important. We can't consider only the consequences if it means violating the rights of others. So uh, in this category we will always find Immanuel Kant who is uh, you know asking us to obey the demand of the moral law irrespective of the consequences or intentions we might uh, want to follow and in this sense willing is different from wanting with which I began my lecture. Others claim that no matter how much you say that you are not interested in the consequences, that you are not interested in the uh, uh, fallout of your actions they still end up being a matter of consideration and an important constituent of your moral practice. Kant in his illustrations on promise keeping asks us to test the maxim of borrowing money with an intention of not keeping the promise to the person from whom you are going to borrow on the principle of universality he wants us to test this maxim. G. S. Mill has pointed out that as per Kant's suggestion when we ask the question what if everybody does what you want to do. Remember the example of lying which we took a while back what if everybody wants to lie as you want to lie. Wasn't Kant here himself worrying about the consequences and the uh, a point here is hidden in the question what if what if everybody else was to follow the same rule. So aren't we here talking about the consequences our act can incur. For instance what will happen if everybody borrows money and does not pay it back in time in spite of their promise then no one else can take advantage of promising falsely either. So in Mill's view that is an appeal of conse to consequences and a valid point against Kantian categorical imperative. In defense of Kant now uh, we may argue that his viewpoint does not look at actual consequences but at the logical implications of a universalized maxim will it or will it not undermine itself. So he was not actually looking at the consequences rather he was looking at a logical implication which we ought to answer if we are universalizing a moral law. Whether Mill was successfully able to criticize Kant or understood him is still a topic of discussion among philosophers and uh, how much uh, if any um, precedence uh, Kant gave to consequences is a matter of debate and uh, taken up by several critiques. Now we come to the third criticism conflict between duties. When we are talking about perfect and imperfect duties in the last lecture uh, we were kind of uh, struggling with 
uh, understanding that how imperfect duties are uh, are uh, do not hold us blameworthy and uh, always you know uh, add more merit to our action our moral actions but perfect duties are absolute in nature now a question comes that is it uh, difficult to establish exactly what those duties and obligations are which are perfect on the one hand and imperf imperfect on the other for instance we have duty towards parents family profession nation humanity among others which one among them is a more primary duty which one is the most significant does it need to be supplemented with a more general theory of what is good is the deontological theory too abstract these are the kind of questions which uh, Immanuel Kant's uh, thesis will have to face. Now again coming to J.S. Mill who is a utilitarian, uh, he accused Immanuel Kant for giving a theory of duty which is too abstract and claimed that it is unable to rule out immoral actions. Kant has been criticized for making duties binding on everyone in all circumstances, for not allowing any exceptions to duties. People fa face conflict in duties in real life and Kant doesn't allow any exceptions. Even if one can get money for his seriously ill wife only by borrowing money from a friend under a false promise, Kant would still regard it as a violation of duty. However, to most of us, commonsensically, it is difficult to accept that if somebody is falling seriously ill, the other, uh, their caregiver, um, their their son or daughter, their husband, their wife wants to borrow money just to keep them alive, even if it is under false promise. Maybe we will grant something like this. Let us elaborate this criticism even further. As we have seen, Kant's uh, philosophy has only one exceptionless rule, and that is giving uh, 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 that is given in the categorical imperative. We are never permitted to do what we cannot will as a universal law or what violates the requirement to treat persons as persons, first and the second categorical imperative. Even with these two tests at hands, at, at our hand, it is not always clear just how they actually apply. So the application is always a challenge. Kant takes the illustration, it is always wrong to make a promise or to lie deliberately. He suggests that if a killer comes to the door asking for a friend of yours inside uh, in, uh, who is hiding inside your home and the killer wants to kill, he intends to kill, you must here tell the truth. In this instance, not breaking the promise would result in someone seriously getting injured or even killed. In this instance, you know that the killer is going to kill your friend and you uh, have to be truthful. Now, even if now if you do not uh, qualify, here the uh, uh, the law of being truthful, then this might end up hurting or killing your own friend. Now, according to Kant, we have to keep the promise, and because consequences do not matter, an innocent person would simply have to be killed. But when we encounter this situation in real life, what is more important? Let us think, let us pause and think. When keeping a promise or preventing an innocent person from being injured or killed, which one is a more important uh, value for us? One of the problems here is that Kant never tells us how to decide between conflicting set of duties, how to uh, decide conflicting duty in those cases, which one to obey how to uh, negotiate between absolute rules to equally absolute rules. We have a duty not to kill or preserve uh, life and a due, uh, uh, oh, sorry, we have a duty not to kill or preserve life and a duty to tell the truth or not to break promises. But which takes precedence? We are having no clue. Kant believed that he was only setting basic principles of morality and establishing it, those principles on a firm basis. Nevertheless, it is reasonable to expect that a moral theory should go further than this and give us uh, actual rules based on application. 
We see that the categorical imperative helps us only in cases where duties are not in conflict. Now, what about the cases where duties might be in conflict to each other? Moral law versus exceptional cases. What about those cases where there are conflicts? With this, uh, we are going to come to the next set of criticism, which is between, which is between uh, absolute moral law on the one hand and exceptions to the moral law on the other. Now, this is a charge of Kant's uh, moral philosophy being too rigorous, too rigidly uniform. Uh, moral laws are seen as empty and formalistic rules with absolutely no content uh, in, uh, in them and which, pres which are prescriptive with much uh, regiment. Another issue with the concept of rules is that where, whether a qualified rule is any less universalizable than the one which is unqualified is a question. One should not make exceptions to a general rule and certainly not for one's self alone. Kant is right in claiming about not making exceptions that one should not make them for uh, one's own self and you know give up generality only because a particular law does not suit them. But after all, the question we are confronted with is that what good is a rule if one can make an exception any time one wants to make an exception or of it. So, but if we qualify this rule, let us pause and think here. If we qualify this rule, do not make promises except when not breaking a promise would seriously harm or kill someone. So we based on the illustration we just uh, discussed a while back are going to qualify this moral law to not break promises with this exception which is when uh, you do not break it except when not breaking a promise would seriously harm or kill someone. The exception applies to the rule itself rather than to some individual or individuals. So we are making an exception to the rule, however we are thinking about exception here as something which applies to the rule itself and not that one individual is making that exception for his or her own aim. Scholars have suggested that there really is nothing wrong with the format of the categorical imperative provided that we are allowed to expand our maxim to include situations in which we might accept certain exceptions to our rule. On the whole, you know, we should not lie, but there may come a day when a killer is stalking a friend of ours and we have a chance to save her. In that case, we may need to lie. So we can universalize not killing with the exception of self-defense and certain other specified cases. We can universalize not lying if it is understood that preventing harm to an innocent person would constitute an exception. Let us take American philosopher Christian Koskard, who has been significantly inspired by Kant's moral philosophy. But she is an ardent critique of Kant's unyielding hard universalism and she proposes a solution here. According to her, we uh, view Kant's categorical imperative as an ideal solution for an ideal world, the kingdom of ends. But that we must also realize that real life is less than perfect and makes other demands on us. The ideal is still important as in principle. But she asks us, why would we even consider that lying to the killer would undermine our intention to lie? Since the killer must surely know that asking where our friend went does not represent a normal situation at all because the killer has an intention of killing and when he is asking uh, about the person who is, whom he or she is going to kill to a friend, then he or she is not expecting a normal response anyway. In other words, in some situations Kant is right, but in some situations we must go beyond the categorical imperative which is an idealistic uh, law where we have to respond to our actions or people we might characterize as evil. So in this case, we are uh, responding to act or person who is evil, that is the killer. Now, you know, when we are responding to a killer, then we have to be more mindful. Now, let us look into the fifth uh, uh, kind of criticism raised uh, against Kantian ethics, um, reason versus inclination, as I have titled it. Actions motivated by feelings and emotions are not considered to be moral. Bernard Williams says, 
that in Kanchan ethics, uh, complete ignorance of the place of, you know, the place of reason and personal relationships, happiness among others. These are the factors which are completely, uh, you know, ignored in order to demand impartial respect for all. The idea of universal moral principles is challenged by our awareness of cultural diversity which we find uh, all around us. Feminist ethical theories have also criticized Kantian ethics to be too male oriented in its focus on reason rather than emotion. We have already seen that Kant stresses on the nature of persons as rational beings. Feminist ethics of care criticizes the universalizing aspect of Kant's morality and stresses the emotional and personal ties that we have to individuals. Kant might reply that we often have no control over how we feel and thus it should not be the key element of our moral lives. We might also point out that uh, it is the common aspects of our existence as persons and not the ways in which we are different and unique that gives us dignity and are the basis for the moral equality that we possess. Whether rich or poor, young or old, all races and all people are alike in having rationality as the defining mark of their humanity. However, it is important to note that Kant himself expressed doubt as to whether women were actually capable of being rational beings. And on the same lines, we can say that, you know, he might have had reservations about people of color and people with any kind of different differences. Another criticism can be raised on Kant's spirit of impartiality. And important questions raised can be in what way does morality require that all persons be treated equally and in what way does it perhaps require that different pers persons should be treated differently? How are we ever going to answer these questions? Now, I have tried to highlight the significant features of Kant's moral philosophy here to um, uh, summarize uh, defense of Kantian morality here. Kant focuses on fairness, consistency, universalizability, treating people as autonomous beings and impartiality as the major uh, factors. Moral equality of all people, nobody should make exceptions for themselves and these are the central features which Kant respects. Morality is grounded in ways in which we are alike as persons rather than ways in which we are different as individuals. Kantian views are a source for all those who want to argue for moral equality and equal moral rights. The discourse of human rights is actually an inspiration drawn from Kant's moral philosophy. There are series of philosophers who have been inspired by Kant like Pritchard, W. D. Ross, Thomas Nagel, John Rawls and they have used the deontological ethics given by Kant and have defined a right independent of good. Uh, there have also been uh, philosophers like Christian Korsgaard, Barbara Herman, Onera O'Neill who have taken a holistic approach to Kant's ethics by reading groundworks and critique of practical reason together with his, with his later writings. And when we look at Kant's reinterpretation from this uh, kind of interpretation, we are able to mitigate the criticism of deontological rationalism levied against him and bring it nearer to some kind of teleology. This interpretation helps us to deal with the criticism of regarding, disregarding the consequences in defining moral good, which we are going to see in this uh, coming lectures. To conclude then, Kant's doctrine is simply a deontological dictum which holds that man is morally good not so far as he acts from passion or self-interest, but so far as he acts as an impersonal principle, on an impersonal principle valid for others as well as for himself. The essence of morality is to perform duty for the sake of duty. It should further a systematic harmony of purposes in the individual and in humanity. The moral law is followed only for its own sake. In this way, he is able to show us that authority of the command, authority to the command of the moral law lies in human person, unlike the divine command theories of the ontology, which uh, put the authority of the moral law in a divine God. To conclude, Kant has not given the content of universal moral principle, but only the form of universal moral principle. I would like uh, you to look into some references for furthering your understanding of Kant's mor moral philosophy. Here is a list of references which I am sharing. You may look into them for um, a more nuanced uh, understanding of Kant's moral philosophy. 
with this uh, I end my lecture. Thank you.